Thank you to Brother Jeremy and the rest of the, the worship team. Am I on here? I'm on here, so hello. You can just put me on this pulpit mic if you want. So um, thank you to Brother Jeremy and to the rest of the worship team for leading us in this time of praise. And before we go into the message, I just want to reflect on some of those words that we sang in that last song, specifically the lyrics to verse two. It says, and when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. There is such beauty in those words. Such beauty. As sinners, we rightfully deserve the price that Christ paid. We rightfully deserve a death on the cross. Yet God in his great and overwhelming love for us decided to send his son as a sacrifice for us. May we never lose sight of the gospel message. May we never cease to see the beauty in what our God has done for us. That is why we come and worship. That is why we're here studying God's word. His word is living and active his word changes lives. He saved us, and for that we are truly grateful. And we can sing to our Savior God, how great thou art, how great thou art. As we get started, I, I want to let you know that as always, it is an honor and a privilege to preach God's word to you. And I just want to say a word of thanks to you as the church for allowing me this opportunity, and also to Brother Trent um, for um, letting me preach on this Sunday. And I know that some of you may be a little hesitant coming in today, seeing that the sermon title um, had to do with a Marvel character, and it's being preached by a youth pastor. But I promise you that God's word will be preached today. It's not going to be a message about a Marvel character. Um, although I think it helps to give us an illustration of um, some things that we find in God's word. And so don't worry about it. Remember last week we talked about worry. It's not going to do you any good anyway. Um, and I assure you that the lesson will be rich in scripture. And um, I want to also let you know that um, I don't know every single thing about the Marvel Universe. I don't know everything about the comics of the Hulk. Um, but um, I do know a little bit. Um, I don't know everything because it first debuted in 1962, and I wasn't first debuted until 1997. So... Um, <laughs> Most of what I know comes from the newer Marvel Universe movies, um, specifically the Avengers movies. And so if you haven't seen those, um, I'll, I'll get into this and I'll explain some of what that is. But in the first Avengers movie, we are introduced to the human side of the Hulk. His name is Bruce Banner. He is a super genius doctor who lives in a remote part of the world and he's using his medical skills to help people in need. He doctors up the sick, he gives them medicine when they need it, and he diagnoses illnesses. He seems to be just a guy doing what he can to help others. But one of the other Avengers, it's a group of world crime fighters, they come together, they're all superheroes, and one of the other Avengers comes to meet with Bruce Banner. And she eventually coerces him to help in this world crime um, that they're fighting. But Banner is hesitant. He's, he he's hesitant to help because he's a little emotionally um, unstable, if you want to put it that way. And particularly, his mental health kind of varies in his anger. He struggles with his anger. And you might ask, why is that a big deal? Well, because when Bruce Banner loses control of his temper, he turns into a big green fighting machine who tears down everything in his path. And so naturally, he's afraid of this anger that he has within him. And when Banner returns to his normal self after being um, 
being the Hulk, he's petrified of the danger that he put others in. He curls up in one of the movies in a corner and he has this look of anxiety on his face, a look of fear. And it's not an external fear of what might happen to him, but it's an internal fear of what he might do to others when he's blinded by his rage. And church, I'd be willing to guess that many of you are living with that same fear. You're terrified of what you might do to someone you love when you face a situation that makes you angry. Or perhaps you might be blind to your anger altogether. You can't see the way that you handle frustrating situations is actually putting others in danger, people that you love and care for. In other words, I think that each one of us has a little bit of the Hulk within us. And if someone does something that irritates us, we can lose control and act in a way that we normally wouldn't act. You might even think of it as becoming a sort of monster that you typically aren't. But no matter where you think you are on the issue of anger, one fact is certain. Every single one of us comes face to face with situations that make us angry. And because of this inevitable reality, it's also true that we all handle those frustrating situations in one way or another. Some of us handle them in healthy ways, while others, not so much. So think about it. How do you manage in the midst of frustrating situations? How do you handle yourself in the midst of frustrating situations? Is it healthy or is it not? Let's take a look at the scriptures to see what they say about our anger and how to handle our, our situations that we're in. The foundational passage that we're going to be in today is found in James 1, 19 through 20. And the book of James is one of my personal all-time favorites because it is very straightforward to the point um, and it has a lot of practical implications. It's easy to read. James, who is the author of the book, James, was also known as James the Just. And if you're curious, um, his name appears in Jewish historical documents in the first century, meaning that we have additional proof that James actually existed and lived when the Bible said that he did. So James was the lead pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. And you can find that in Acts 15. That means he was the leader of the, the first local church because, as we see in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit descended to those in Jerusalem at Pentecost. And so James was a pastor of that church, um, or the leader of that church. James is also considered by scholars to be the brother of Jesus. And this is significant for us because that means he was raised in the same household as Jesus, James saw Jesus grow from a child into an adult, yet James still starts out his letter in James 1.1 with James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of us who have siblings, which is probably most of us out there, can you imagine calling your brother or sister Lord? Not, not me. I'm not about to call my brother or sister Lord. And even better yet, can you imagine saying that you are their servant? That, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not their servant. And especially I'm the older brother, you know. I'm not, they, I'm not, I'm not their servant. But, you know, I, I, we just don't do that. We're not going to call our brother Lord. We're not going to call, um, our, uh, call us their servant. But here we see James, who is the brother of Jesus, do just that. He says, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he starts his message. The only explanation that I can think of is that James is truly convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is who he said he was. And if someone can convince his adult brother that he is God incarnate, then I think there's some merit in that statement. Now, like I said earlier, I really like the book of James because it is very matter of fact and to the point. It's blunt. And on top of that, James doesn't sugarcoat anything. 
And even at times we find him using some sarcasm. If you want to see what I mean, you can look at um, James 2 verse 19. This book contains a lot of practical advice for us to apply to our lives, which makes it a perfect reference for our foundational passage today. So James gives us here in James 1, 19 through 20, some things that will be practical and godly ways for us to handle ourselves in the midst of frustrating situations. Here's what he says, starting in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In this passage, James gives us three commands, which are followed up by the reason why he gives us the commands. And I don't know about you, but I really appreciate this. He tells us exactly what to do and then tells us exactly why we need to do it. And you know those people who, when you ask them a question about why they just told you to do something, they say something along the lines of, because I said so? Well, James doesn't do that here, and I love that. James, he gives us an exact reason when we ask the why question. So as we seek to answer the question, how do you manage in the midst of frustrating situations, we need to turn our attention to the first of the three tasks James has given to us. And then the task number one, be quick to hear. Be quick to hear. So how can being quick to hear prevent our anger? How can being quick to hear prevent our anger? I like to call this one giving people the benefit of the doubt. My mom has always been very good at this. Growing up, um, she would be faced with situations that would make the average person extremely upset, but she would very, very rarely let it provoke her into anger. And for instance, uh, my mom used to work at a Title I elementary school in the Dallas area. And um, she was constantly dealing with children that were misbehaving in the classroom. I remember one time she had come home after her students were just awful the whole day. And they were giving her a hard time. They were talking back to her. They were rude. And I remember her coming home um, and she was telling us this story. And I just sat there. How... How could you let them talk to you like that? It was, you know, my thought. How could you um, allow this stuff to happen? And, like, how are you not mad in the midst of all of this? And if I were in that situation, I know I wouldn't have handled it as well as she did. And she simply answered this. Well, I know, uh, I know what those students are going through outside of school. She said... They're, they're going through things that I can't even imagine. So, before I get angry with them, I need to pull them aside and hear them out on why they might be acting that way. And so, while their behaviors were definitely ones deserving of discipline, their behaviors were not ones deserving of anger. Instead of exploding on these students who were already going through hard times, she was quick to hear. Quick to hear. And this is what James instructs us in verse 19. We ought to be quick to hear in all circumstances. We must give people the benefit of the doubt, not letting anger swell up in our hearts. See, we tend to be... Um, not quick to hear because we assume we already know the motives of the other person. And James says that this isn't so. Oftentimes we have no idea what somebody else is going through um, or what they're really thinking. We must be quick to hear, keeping our assumptions out of the situation. When we are quick to hear the other side, we understand where the person is at and why they might be acting the way that they are. Being quick to hear will help us to stop that hulk within us. And the second task that James gives us is closely connected with the first. We have be quick to hear, and then the second, be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. 
We are tasked to be slow to speak because there are no good reasons for people to be quick to speak. When we are quick to speak, we are one of two things. We are either offensive or defensive. When somebody takes on the offensive, there are usually a ton of accusations against the other person. You might hear them sound like this. Well, you never do this. You always do that. Not one single time have I ever seen you help me in this way. When we are quick to offend, it's because we want to be quick to call out the flaws in somebody else. And this usually reminds me of TV reality shows, or should I say fakeality shows, where one person is trying to stir up drama, they're stirring the pot because they're naming all of these bad qualities that's happening with another person on the show. And we sit back on our couches or our sofas, recliners, and we're watching these shows thinking, wow, these people are crazy. They're wild. Like, what in the world are they doing? Why would she ever say something like that about her? Like, they're both beautiful. Calm down. And then we turn the TV off, and we're guilty of doing the exact same thing. And oftentimes, it's people that we're in the same house with. The offenses ring out in our own homes. He never takes out the trash. She always leaves the pantry door open. Not one single time have my kids ever helped me wash the dishes or pick up clothes. If we are quick to speak, it is easy to take on the offensive and put unnecessary anger into our lives. And similarly, there are times when we enter into frustrating situations and our initial reaction is to defend ourselves as much as possible. I mean, clearly the other person doesn't understand me in these situations, right? Clearly, I need to explain my side and tell them why I acted in this way until they finally get my point, right? Isn't that the best situation? Not, not quite, and here's why. One, they may already understand you. People can understand you and still disagree with what you say. And two, if they don't understand you, then telling them about the same thing over and over again is not going to help your situation. It's, uh, I'm sure that most of y'all are familiar with the famous quote. It says, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, I think that applies here. Both the offensive and the defensive are bad because their outcomes divide people. Their outcomes divide people. These reactions are how conversations turn into debates, how debates turn into arguments, and how arguments turn into fights. James actually talks about this in chapter four of his letter. In verse one of chapter four, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? We keep focusing on our passions, on our desires, on our side. If you only understood how I feel, we shout, if I need to have this and you always do that, there's an overwhelming odor of pride in our talk and our conversations begin to take on a tone of war. We must reconsider our actions for James goes on in verse 6 to say, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Instead of being quick to defend ourselves or quick to offend somebody else, we must be slow to speak. By being slow to speak, we humble ourselves. We draw near to God and we place value on the relationships in our lives. We should seek to bring that relationship back together and restore it to a sense of harmony, not leave it fractured and broken. And if you think about it, simply the fact that we are using the language of offensive and defensive tells us that we are viewing our conversation as more of a battle that we ought to win than an attempt to bring peace and reconciliation to the relationship. Our goal should not be to win an argument, but instead to love our neighbor. 
A wise theologian named Francis Schaeffer once said, if I have only an hour with someone, I will spend the first 55 minutes asking questions and finding out what is troubling their heart and mind. And then in the last five minutes, I will share something of the truth. Shouldn't we all have that same approach when dealing with another person who is created in the image of God? We must hear them out, understand where they're at, and be quick to hear and slow to speak. Only that last five minutes of the hour are we sharing a bit of the truth. So church, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and finally, be slow to anger because our anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And I heard an old story um, that illustrates this very well at one point during high school. But Miss Angela didn't know this, but she kind of beat me to my own lesson. So I have a little fence post here hammering some nails. But you guys already know how this ends. And so I'm not going to bore you with going through it one more time. But the idea is that you have all of these holes in the relationship. So at the end of it, when you let your anger come out on somebody else, you put holes, or Miss Angela called them scars, into that relationship. And um, those holes or those scars are not easily repaired. You can, you know, fill the holes, you can mask them, you can cover them up, but they're still there, and there's still pain. And when we, when we have our relationships and they're characterized by fits of rage and anger, then they leave scars. No matter how hard we try to cover them up or we ask for forgiveness, there's still some pain and suffering that's there. And so when you let your anger take control of you, it creates those holes and scars and they last for a long, long time. And so friends, the way that we handle a frustrating situation is important. The way that we handle our anger matters. The anger of man is a painful thing and it involves people fighting people. It involves people putting their own desires above the desires of others. It involves selfishness. And what it ends in is broken relationships and heartache. In church, we must work diligently to follow the tasks that James gave us in his letter. Not just because he said so, but because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And we know those fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Have you ever seen a situation where somebody's angry and those fruits are produced because of that? Not once. Because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It doesn't produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Instead, it produces the fruits of man, or the fruits of the flesh. It creates distrust. There's suffering, divisions, disunity, divorce, rage, enmity, hate, strife. That's the fruit of the anger of man. It's not the righteousness of God. It's not what we are seeking. Being slow to anger will help us produce the righteousness of God. And because of this, we will love others well and represent our God as the good and caring Father that He is. Each of us must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It does not produce the righteousness of God. In church, this can only be done through Christ. It can only be done through Jesus. 
It can only be done through a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and you have accepted him as Lord of your life, then God has put that Holy Spirit within you and it can bear the fruits of the Spirit. That Spirit allows you to develop in your relationship with God. It allows you to grow closer to Him, looking more like Him each day. The the Spirit of God gives you the ability to pursue the fruits of the Spirit when coping with your frustrations. And the the fruit of the Spirit will help us in our relationships to mend them and to bring them together instead of dividing. Each of these, especially patience and self-control out of those fruits of the Spirit, will help you to follow those tasks that James gave to us to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And if you are in Christ, God has given you the ability to stop that hulk within you. You don't have to live a life characterized by rage any longer. You don't have to live a life characterized by anger, by madness, by distrust, by disunity. You don't have to live a life characterized by those things. That was the way of your life before Christ. But now that you know Jesus, you can practice true love, true patience, true peace. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. He said, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is what the new self looks like. The new self is kind. The new self is tenderhearted. And it's forgiving. Let these characterize your attitude as you're in conversations with others, being quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So church, I ask you one last time, How do you manage in the midst of frustrating situations? Is it healthy? James has told us the healthy way to handle our conflict. If people looked at your life, would they say that you are a person who is quick to hear? Would they say that you are a person who is slow to speak? Would they say that you are a person who is slow to anger? Let every Christian brother and sister seek to implement these healthy habits into their lives. And we will love others well and represent our Father in heaven for who he truly is. You can stop the Hulk within you. And it's through God's word and what he has given to us. So just put those into practice. Put those into practice in your everyday life, in your relationships at home, in your relationships at work, in your relationships at school for you students and children, put those things into practice wherever you are. And you will represent your father well and love others well. In just a moment, I will pray and Brother Jeremy will come lead us in a final song. And as we sing, I just ask you to think about your relationship with God. If you don't have one and you'd like to start one, now's the time. Don't wait on it. Don't wait. And you can come forward during this last song and tell me, tell um, another pastor that'll be up front. We would love to have that conversation with you. And if you're thinking about joining this church, if you'd like to become a part of this church family, great churches all around, but if you feel like this is the place for you, we would love for you to come up and, and let us know. We'd love to share that with everyone. And... Maybe some of you have been a believer for a long time and you're feeling God just press on your heart saying, I'm calling you to something even more than what you're doing. If he's calling you into a life of ministry, of leading in some form or fashion in in his church, then I would encourage you to come down as well. 
so that we can have that conversation with you and share it with everyone. So as we do that, let me pray, and then Brother Jeremy will come up and lead us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have given us this time to worship you. I thank you that we have the freedom here to do that. Thank you that here in Paris, Tennessee, we are not, um, we're not ridiculed or slandered or, um, or forced to, to leave our building. But God, you have given us the safe place to worship you, and we are grateful for that. For almost 100 years, we have been able to worship right here in this building, and that is so, so exciting. And God, I pray that as we worship you and as we seek to obey what you have called us to do, that we would apply this message from James to our lives. That we would apply the the three commands that he has given us to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. God, we know that our anger will not produce your righteousness And we ask that we would produce your righteousness through the fruits of the Spirit and through the many ways that you work in this world and through us. God, we ask that you would um, just be with those who are going into work, going into their family situations, going into school, and are dealing with frustrating situations. I pray that they would apply this word to their hearts, to their lives, and that they would understand um, more and more what it means to to be at peace, to pursue patience, to pursue self-control. God, I pray that they would know what it means to be forgiving and tender-hearted and kind. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.